think every now and then it's it's nice to step out of, uh, of our science world and just think about sort of the bigger world and things that go on. And so when I was asked um, to speak on short notice, I, I asked uh, which topics would make sense or that people might want to hear. And, and I think this is worth hearing. If it weren't, I wouldn't be standing here taking any of your time um, telling it to you. Uh, you may feel otherwise, and halfway through, feel free to leave. That's fine. <laughs> but I, so I'm going to talk about my perspectives and my experience as chief scientist at NASA. Um, and this was really an incredible opportunity, as you'll see. But one of the things I loved about it is really, I, I felt like I had a front row seat to some of society's greatest achievements. It, the stuff that NASA does is phenomenal, and um, to, to be a part of it, to be among the people making the decisions that influence it, really was a privilege and an honor and a great experience. I'm going to start with a little video. You've seen um, something like this before, I'm sure, but it's worth showing you. Things that are looking good coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere uh, as we go in here. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth keys. Universal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. Have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. The parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Sea chill step has separated. We're we on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers descending. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> talk about science at NASA, um, 
And some of this you'll see in the next are sort of my general audience types of presentation slides. But the um, really what we do is pursue questions that are really at the heart of the human spirit. And things that people have wondered about since people have begun wondering. This involves or includes peering to the edges of the universe and really back to the beginning of time as we understand it. From the time you know, humans could stand upright and look upward, they wondered about the stars. My kids' first songs, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, it's not, it's not, it's in us, right? It's in that child in us, it's in that adult in us, and it really is fundamental to who we are. Uh, another aspect of the NASA science portfolio is exploring our celestial neighbors. Understanding the origin and evolution of the solar system and what that means for the evolution of Earth. Exploring the sun that fuels us, really that fuels life on Earth. You know, we think about the bottom of the food chain of the basic element of life as plants, right? The photosynthesis, the glucose. I think of it as the photon. None of that happens without the photons. Understanding the planet we live on today, and probably more importantly, the planet that our descendants will live on tomorrow. Okay? And all of this, when we look at the Earth processes, all of this happens just in a thin veneer of atmosphere. Okay? It, as, you, as you zoom out from the Earth, and look at it, it's amazing. That, and, and I mean, this is even, we're talking about a little sliver of the atmosphere that you see here that really sustains and supports life. And then another aspect of the portfolio, one that most of us here are probably not as familiar with, is really understanding the biological and physical processes in the microgravity environment. And how do things behave when you take away the gravity vector? Biology changes. It's an analog for, for aging, actually, rapid aging. Physics changes. Something as simple as the burning of a match no longer has the shape that we're used to. Okay, the movement of fluids, when you remove that gravity vector, none of that really comes into play. So I would sum this up, uh, again, for general audiences, as science to inspire and science to serve. Really, the science that we do at NASA is, in my view, both inspirational and valuable to society as a whole. And if you look at, um, how much would you pay for that kind of science? If you, if you look at the budget uh, of NASA, this is the breakdown, okay? The human space flight, um, this is about an eight, the overall budget is about $18 billion, and we take out what it takes to run NASA. This is the remainder and the breakdown. Human space flight, 57%. Science, 35%, about $5 billion on the science budget. Oddly, the second A in NASA, aeronautics, is only 4% of the budget. Um, education, a smaller fraction than that, and then space technology. So this $5 billion, compare that to the National Science Foundation, which is about $7 billion, to the Department of Energy's uh, Office of Science, which is $5 billion, the USGS is $1 billion, and NOAA as a whole, all of NOAA, is about $5 billion. So it, it's a pretty sizable chunk of research funds. And this is the breakdown. Um, forget the top line, and apparently civil servants didn't cost anything prior to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite understand that. But the, um, uh, Helio, the, the vast majority actually is Earth and planetary science. Okay? This is because it costs a lot to go to Mars or Jupiter with, with robotic probes or um, Saturn or the outer planets, but the bulk of the expenditure is in Earth science, um, with planetary about the same. Astrophysics behind that, but only because the James Webb Space Telescope got so big it became its own thing. Um, and that is supposed to, right now we can look back a little over 13 billion years as we look deeper and deeper into space. We think the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years. This is to take us, we're at about 13.3, we're trying to get back to the next 500 million years. It's, you know, you're pushing the envelopes there. There are a lot of technical reasons why that's so hard, but basically JWST is its own budget item. 
and then heliophysics. Now, heliophysics isn't just studying the sun to understand it. Uh, particularly relevant to NOAA, it's studying the effects of solar activity on the Earth environment. We have a lot of vulnerable assets in space and vulnerable assets on the ground, quite blank, frankly, that are affected by the sun's activity. So this is the budget breakdown. Um, now I'll leave it at that. And now I want to just get into the structure so you can kind of understand my role or my function and, and how that works. Um, you don't need to read all of this. I'll summarize it um, now and in the next slide. But we have the, the head of NASA, the NASA administrator, his deputy, the associate administrator. These two are political appointees, appointed by the President of the United States. Um, interestingly, the current administrator was actually a finalist uh, on the short list when President um, George W. Bush was in office, actually was considering him. But President Obama appointed him. The deputy administrator historically is much more a political animal. The Bush people had no interest in her. Um, but uh, she worked a lot on the Hillary Clinton campaign, initially in the primaries and subsequently the Obama campaign, uh, is a leader in space policy. Um, and then the associate administrator is the highest ranking civil servant at NASA, sort of the chief operating officer institutional memory that presumably goes through the political cycles is above the political fray. Um, and then a bunch of other people, the associate administrators who implement the activities, the chiefs who advise, um, the chief financial officer who does more than advise, that's the accountant and actually determines a lot of stuff. Um, chief information, a lot of support functions, and then the NASA center. So in a general, form, we have the Office of the Administrator, his people, um, the mission directorates, the support functions, the advisors, this was me, the Office of the Chief Scientist, and then the NASA centers. And above the Administrator, the President of the United States, he reports directly to the President, unlike NOAA, for example, where um, the NOAA Administrator, it, we're part of Commerce. So the no administrator reports to the Secretary of Commerce, who then reports to the President. NASA actually has a direct line. Um, and then uh, below that, about 100,000 employees, investigators, any of you with NASA funding, um, recipients of contracts, people who build stuff for the agency, and the like. So it's kind of a, a really large element of the um, Economy, the economic system, at least in the science and technology realm, have links to NASA. Okay. So my function was to advise the administrator and actually serve with six other people, the chief financial <coughs> officer, the chief technologist, myself, and then the administrator, the deputy, the associate administrator, and then uh, one other person. I was called the executive council. And as my boss, Charlie Bolden, would say, we had the job of making the decisions that if they were the wrong ones, would get us on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, sometimes I think we made the right decisions and we still ended up on the front page of the Washington Post. But nonetheless, it was the big, you know, direction things. Now, make no mistake, this is all within NASA. It still has to go up here. And even though this is a thin line, everybody's got opinions. Something happens between here and here, where everybody's got opinions that, that change things, weigh things. And then it leaves the president and Congress as 565 opinions that it likes to throw into the mix. So um, a previous administrator used to say, what frustrates me most about being an administrator is knowing that when I make a decision, that means the conversation can begin. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. You think the top of the agency could just dictate, but it isn't so. Anyway, so this was, what, the reason I show this chart is because for the first time in NASA's history, an administrator consciously said, I want science to have a seat at the grown-up table. I want science to weigh into all of the agency decisions. I don't want to make a decision without hearing from the science side the implications of those decisions, the values of those decisions, and 
you know, he looked to me and I looked to nobody next to me. I couldn't believe it was actually me that was offering the input, but I did, and I tried to do my best to provide him that input. Um, but really, what was amazing was how seriously he took that input, how much he weighed it, along with technology, how much he weighed it in with the human space flight, you know, the elephant in the NASA room, that's the big chunk of the budget, and that's what people think about, but, but the administrator would put science right there, I wouldn't say front and center, but in the front and center cluster. It, it, it weighed heavily, and he would send me to the White House, to the Office of Science and Technology Policy, to OMB, and tell, he'd tell me, explain the science story to them. You know, explain why NASA wants to do this from a science perspective. And then come back and tell me what they say, you know, why they're objecting, or why they, you know, what resonates, what doesn't. So my function really was to provide representation of NASA scientists, science interests to the highest level of NASA management and the federal government. So heads of the other agencies, uh, Jane Luchenko and, and Kathy Sullivan, Marsha McNutt at USGS, uh, Super Suresh at NSF, all of these people, you know, we, we would meet periodically and, and you know, share science stories, uh, or science plans at least, but also OSTP, OMB. And he wanted an independent voice. We have the Associate Administrator for Science. We have the person in charge of the five billion dollar budget who makes it happen, that wasn't me. I happily had no budget, and that's a very liberating thing, because what happens is, when you go talk to people, I only have no budget now, I want money now, but, but back then, when, when you talk to people, the posture is different. You know, if the associate administrator with his five billion dollar budget went and talked to OSTP or people on the Hill or whatnot, They'd always be, he's trying to get more, he's trying to protect the budget, always viewing through that lens. I was actually freed up from those implementations and concerns. You could just have a conversation. What's the right thing here? How does NASA science fit into the broader national framework? How does what we're trying to do match what you're trying to do, whether you're a representative of the president or you're a representative of a senator, a congressperson, or some other agency? Um, I served as a key point of contact for the science, for scientific matters at NASA. This was to the external community, OMB, the Hill. But really, I guess, to summarize, what I tried to do was work toward alignment. Alignment between, alignment among what NASA was trying to do, what the White House wanted us to do, what the scientific community identified as its priorities through the decadal surveys, and what Congress would let us do, or let us get away with. And sometimes that was pounding the pavement with members of Congress and their staff to try and explain to them why it was in their interest to support what we were trying to do. So this really was my job. It's a piece of cake, right? Um, there were a number of challenges associated with this. First and foremost, the difficult budget environment. And the challenge of level funding. You know, we were, I was told from day one, don't expect, you know, what do they say, flat is the new up. You know, don't expect your budget to go up. If you're lucky, it'll stay flat. If you're neutral, it'll go down a little. And if you're unlucky, you know, you'll know. You'll know when you're on line. Uh, plus the rising cost of access to space. Simply launching something costs a lot of money. And it costs a lot more now than it did five or 10 years. Cost overruns and perceptions of overruns. Um, there were some real cost overruns, but it didn't matter. Um, sometimes if people just sort of, one cost overrun would spill into another mission. Oh, NASA can't build anything on cost, you know, so they just assumed everything was over budget. Um, one example of this was the James Webb Space Telescope. Currently, and I think it, it's eight, $8 billion. It's a lot of money to look back in time. Um, if you think about it though, you go into these things and um, you go into these things and you don't know how you're going to do them sometimes. So here's an example. So the James Webb Space Telescope operates at about 40 Kelvin. 
40 kelvin, it's cold. And there was no known adhesive that held its adhesive properties at 40 kelvin. Good project for the chemists in the audience here. Um, how do you just go out, how do you price that? What's it cost to invent something that doesn't exist? Uh, so that, that's one. <laughs> Another is the phasing of money. You have a budget plan that says if I get the money at this time in this manner, I can build something for X dollars. Well, what happens is you build up your army, and uh, the start of the fiscal year comes along, August, October 1st, and you know, even though that deadline has been in place since the Constitution was written, it doesn't seem to be possible to get a budget in place. You, you had, you know, 220 years of advance notice. <laughs> so you've got an army, but it's illegal to spend a certain amount of money on certain things because they haven't been approved by the budget. That's another thing I don't think people realize. If Congress doesn't approve it, it's illegal to spend money on it. It's like you're breaking the law if you spend money. So that huge inefficiencies result there. Uh, a difficult political environment, especially in the case of NASA, and anyone who's followed the agency knows that it's overcommitted. But the biggest problem to me is that NASA is iconic. Everybody has strong views, very strong views, and largely divergent on what NASA should and should not be doing. To some people, this is NASA. To most people, this is NASA. We had NASA of the past. NASA of the present, a lot of people want more of this. Other people think, why are we wasting our money on human space flight? It costs so much, and what does it get us? Really, science, that's the thing. Or others think, you know, we really should be spending NASA money on technology. Or even if you say science, people argue, should it be Earth? Should it be Mars? Should it be Venus? Should it be astrophysics? Should we spend more on the sun? And people feel passionately, but not similarly. I mentioned Congress, 565 opinions. Well, uh, probably 100 of them don't care. But the 465 <laughs> opinions about what NASA should be doing, and they're all strong, and they're largely divergent. And that's left us in a place where um, everybody wants something from NASA, and uh, there's just too much to deliver on. And the NRC did a report recently on NASA's strategic direction, and it basically said, this is our problem. There's no strong, compelling national vision for the human spaceflight program, which is arguably the centerpiece of NASA's spectrum of mission areas. The lack of national consensus on NASA's most publicly visible mission has resulted in the lack of strategic focus. People wonder what NASA is doing. That was hard for me in my job. And that was exacerbated by the fact that it was on my watch that the shuttle program um, and so what you see here, the, the final landing of the shuttle is just people in space. So. <laughs> um, the, the final voyage, I forgot which one went to the in Los Angeles, but they, they you know, did a lovely road show, um, flying over the Capitol, flying over the Golden Gate Bridge and elsewhere. The last crew, um, STS-135, the last crew to fly on the shuttle. And people equated the shuttle with NASA. Still spending $18 billion, but the shuttle ended, and I got so much, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry NASA's done. I'm sorry NASA's closed. What are you going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. And the front page of the Washington Post had this, uh, the Washington Post Express, had this headline, Lost in Space, you know, what's, what's NASA going to do? Um, people really thought we were out of the space business. And, and here's, here's a little Washington lesson. People were furious, furious with President Obama for ending our space program and forcing us to rely on the Russians to get to and from the space station. And President Obama added two shuttle missions. The Bush administration had, had canceled things earlier. And he implemented an idea that was first put forth by Newt Gingrich and Bob Walker, two very conservative Republicans, saying the government shouldn't be doing this anymore, lower orbit stuff. The commercial sector should be doing this. 
This is something private industry should do. We've, we've shown them how to do it. Turn them loose. They can realize the efficiency. They won't have all the government reviews and red tape to make everything cost so much more. And the Democrats hated the idea. Well, the Obama administration comes in and says, you know, we really should be doing it. I give them credit for that. It's painful. I give them credit for that. Democrats are all for it. And the Republicans are like, this is an abomination. You know, they're ending an American institution. To their credit, Newt Gingrich and Bob Walker wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal that said, to our conservative colleagues, shut up. This is what we want. This is a very conservative idea. And just because, you know, they put their political flavor, just because President Obama finally does one thing right in his administration doesn't mean you shouldn't recognize that and support that. Very, very, it was remarkable. A lot of whether something happened or not just boiled down to who said it, whose idea they thought it was. So NASA is iconic. NASA has a lot on its plate. People want this. But to get this, the federal government spent that compared to today's NASA budget. Okay. Uh, five and a half, yeah, five and a half percent of the federal budget during the Apollo era, as opposed to 0.5% today. So everybody's got strong feelings. Everybody wants that, but they're only willing to pay this. And they don't get that, so people get upset. And part of my job is to try and calm people down and um, tell them that at least we got science. <laughs> science is doing great things. And in fact, the science budget didn't change that much over all of that time. The science budget, you know, it's here today, it's it's about that, it's about a third. Well, here, it's about that, not a third, but about the same amount in today's dollars. Um, and science has really been a bright spot. I mean, when Curiosity landed, it was broadcast 28, yeah, it, was, it was 120, one, roughly 1.30 in the morning, broadcast in Times Square on the Jumbotron. They got New Year's Eve coverage. And people were chanting science, science, science. They were chanting science. It's an amazing thing. Partly because it was broadcast without volume, so they had to fill it with something. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory got over a billion hits on its streaming video. A billion hits. Think about that. Seven billion people roughly in the world. Factor out the ones that don't have internet. That's a large fraction of the population. Or as the director of JPL said, since this was August and the campaigns were in full swing, in the United States, they estimated 50 million voters watched the, the landing of curiosity. Really, really incredible thing. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Earth science, because one reason that my boss, uh, Charlie, wanted an Earth scientist in this position was because it presents some of the greatest challenges for NASA, our most complex relationships. One, other agencies do it. right? If you're talking about Saturn, it's not like anyone's going to say, oh, what agency sends probes to Saturn? Is that NSF that did that? No, they're not going to say it. But Earth, you have NOAA, you have USGS, you have a number of other, of other things. So that, and then the political aspect. Um, some people just don't like Earth science. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. And so, you know, I tell people, for the job, I was, I was an adequate scientist. Yeah, I was good enough. Oh, there are better scientists than I out there that we could have picked. But he wanted an Earth scientist, so that narrowed the field some. And he wanted a scientist who could communicate. When I first got there, he said, our biggest challenges right now are in communication. You know, helping people understand what we're trying to do. Helping us understand what it is people, important people are expecting from us. And trying to achieve that alignment. Trying to sync that up. And so I went on a communication campaign. And one of the first things that landed uh, on my desk. I don't expect you to be able to read this, except for this. Congress of the United States. Six signatures. It was sent to Chairman Wolf, Frank Wolf, um, uh, Chairman of the Commerce, Justice, and Science Subcommittee. Uh, oh, and also 
House Committee on Appropriations, Harold Rogers. Uh, so the top people who talk about commerce, justice, and science, and appropriations, the money. But really what I want you to catch is this phrase here. With your help, we can reorient NASA's mission back toward human space flight by reducing funding for climate change research and reallocating those funds to NASA's human space flight accounts, all while moving discretionary funding toward FY 2008 levels. This letter started out with, you know, why, why is NASA spending money on the great hopes we all know is climate change? Hey, I know, let's take it and spend it on human space flight put NASA back on the right track. This gets back to what I said about NASA being iconic. And to these people, it's about human spaceflight. Okay, a little science, but not Earth science. Why, why that? You don't want that. Can't have that. Um, so in my response, I went back to the Space Act of 1958, NASA's founding document. And the first element of the Space Act. I was thrilled when I read this. I gotta admit, I hadn't read the Space Act prior to this. The expansion of human knowledge of Earth. Yeah, I get that. Earth. And the phenomena in the atmosphere and space. And this is what NASA was built on. And this is a critical element of NASA. But this leads to an important thing. Is, is like it or not, these are people that influence these people that ultimately influence what NASA gets to do. So this um, made me think long and hard about how to communicate, um, in particular, controversial science. This is more, this applies to any kind of science now. This is my lessons in communication from Washington, D.C. Um, the first is understand the context. Okay. What makes people say or act the way they do Say the things they say. This was a huge lesson. Those in opposition to you are not as dumb as you want them to be. Okay, we do this all the time. That person is so stupid. How can they say this? We get all fired up in you know, political circles as well. The reality is they're probably not stupid. They probably just value things differently than you do, see things differently than you do. So if you take the time to understand where they're coming from, because usually people don't. That actually gives you the edge. If I know where you're coming from and you're just clueless about me, you think I'm some kind of idiot, then there's, well, that doesn't put me in a great light, but, but there is a, um, there's a strength there. There's an ability to move a conversation around that you don't get if you're just butting heads, assuming each other's too dumb to understand the truth of what you're saying. Uh, Frame things in a way that resonate. This is huge. Do not be the condescending authority. Particularly when someone's been elected, boy, there, there are a lot of, well, you go through a lot to get elected, and that makes some people behave in certain ways. Um, <laughs> that don't appreciate a condescending thing. You know, a lot of times we as scientists say, you know, it's just understood, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we come from on high because we have PhDs that are educated. Or you're not. You know, I mean, it's everybody's got a valuable opinion. And when you show that respect, you get a lot farther in communicating. Former head of NASA used to be fond of saying, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. To me, that's kind of the epitome of what not to do. Now, he was talking to his subordinates who had to listen and laugh when he said it, but um, the reality is, if you're really trying to persuade, inform someone, carry a conversation or position forward, this doesn't do it. You gotta frame it in a way that resonates. When I did this with climate change, I, I could get everyone to agree on two things. There's value to knowing what tomorrow will bring. Forget man-made climate change. Forget, oh, you're gonna impose what kind of fuel efficiencies on my vehicles? There's value to knowing what tomorrow will bring. And the second piece was investing in learning that will pay off in the future. Same conversation. Well, it's not the same. Conversation about the same topic. I was trying to get 
recognition and appreciation for the NASA Earth Science Budget. Had a lot more success with some people with that kind of conversation than, you know, sea levels are going to go up two meters and we're all screwed, so you better hurry up and cut down, you know, fuel or increase fuel efficiency standards on vehicles. And a lot of scientists say it the latter way. It does not work. It works on people that it doesn't need to work on. It works on people that are already, you know, are already with you. Um, don't tell people what to think. It kind of follows from the two above. I would always say, well, let me explain to you why I feel the way I do, why I think the way I think. And, and by saying that, instead of you should, blah, 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 they hear you. Because it starts out with, yeah, I'll hear you, and then I'll point out where you're wrong. But if you do it right, they'll listen. And if you take the next step and say, look, I get where you are. Okay? Your, you, your belief is rooted in your values. You value personal freedom. Okay? You value limited government intrusion in our lives. I get that. Okay? Let me tell you why I think. And let's have a conversation about you know, how those two sync up somehow. But don't expect your values, what you think is important, to change what they believe. Okay? Instead, it works much better if you work toward a, all right, let's lay down some facts, value-free, okay? lay down some, some data, talk about it with a recognition of how this is going to impact what you think, what I think, and let's have an honest conversation. Too often we expect to win people over to our values. If they're really deeply held values, you will not win them over. And you will lose that conversation. Third is don't, or last is don't be outcome centric. And if you focus on winning someone over, you, you kind of lose sight of all this other stuff. And this is where I, you know some of my colleagues with climate change and the scare tactics, not saying I hate them, but some extreme claims. Yeah, two meter rise in sea level scares me to death. That's uh, terrifying if you think of what it could do. That's not where you start the conversation. Yeah, it may not happen. But um, if you focus on empowering others to at least think rationally, they'll shut down when, you, when they sense you're being outcome centered. You're trying to take me to a place, you're trying to get your values to change my beliefs, and it's over. This chart is actually probably the most useful thing I learned or put into practice in my time in Washington. Um, but at the end of the day, it was about science. It was about exploring the universe, our surroundings, understanding what's around us and our place in it. So uh, this is the Butterfly Nebula, just a beautiful uh, death of a star. It's really pretty. Um, you all know this planet, but do you know that planet? That's actually Earth. You've probably seen the pale blue dot. This is this view from the Cassini spacecraft on the far side of Saturn from where Earth is. Makes you view yourself, your planet, your place in the cosmos a little bit differently when you look at things this way. But a lot of what we do uh, at NASA has been dedicated towards understanding system. All right, we've got the suite of satellites orbiting every 90, 100 minutes, uh, looking at different aspects of the atmosphere, the ice, the ocean, the land. Most of you know all this, but I put this up just to remind you, there are these sentinels, there are these observing capabilities that really, of all the things NASA invests in, um, drive home to the point that it's about understanding ourselves, our planet, our place. Um, some of the more memorable items, uh, I had a lot of great memories built up when I was at NASA. The first one, though, was not a terribly pleasant one. This was when I was announced, um, when my selection was announced. This was just a blog by Debbie Schuzel. Um, <laughs> I love the meter, kind of. Uh, but these are some, some quotes from that blog. And the bloggosphere, boy, give any but give any person a computer and a First Amendment, which I fully support, and that is us. 
Um, <laughs> this is some of the some of the quotes. The Obama administration picked an Arab whose surname indicates that he might be Muslim. But it's not certain as its top scientist. Figures. <laughs> I, I, when I saw this, I wanted to email her. My mother was a Baptist. I just wanted to <laughs> um, what are his politics? What's his background? His bio is all over the net. Are carefully cleansed of such information. It leaves a huge question mark. I'm sure all of your bios on the internet have all your politics and all that. <laughs> On the other hand, maybe he keeps his nose out of Arabic politics, which would be a good thing. But I doubt it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Another memory is, um, you know, it was a lot of work, a lot of people working very hard, and I came across this con con <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can read with the table. Because everybody's getting together after work to do some more work. You in? Um, I don't know how it was, just point for stuff. Another uh, bittersweet memory was the um, the uh, service for Neil Armstrong. Actually, meeting Neil Armstrong. I, I sat in the administrator's office. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and John Glenn were all getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. I sat in the administrator's office with all of them. Except the Armstrong, um, he stayed at his hotel, and I'm like, I can't believe I'm here. You know, these are guys that are heroes of mine. Um, and, and anyone who's heard me talk about, give a talk about NASA, you've heard my story about when I was a kid and how my best friend Matt Perry and I would drink our tank in his kitchen, and then we'd walk out to his shed, you know, on the Saturn Five. We'd walk out, and we'd walk in slow motion like we saw on TV. <laughs> <laughs> So we get in this shed, we get on a swing or whatever, and we, we bang against the sides of the walls, and, and we, we'd stop, and we, we'd land, and we're on the moon, and we open the shed door, and we'd step out. You know, and he got to go first, because he was, it was his shed. <laughs> <laughs> so he was Neil Armstrong. But I was Buzz Aldrin. It wasn't that. And then, I know some of you have heard this, but there was a third kid. It's a recording, I won't say the name. We, uh, we let him be Michael Collins, you know, the third guy, and we wouldn't let him out of the shed. <laughs> go play and come back and tell him all about it. So, so to meet Neil Armstrong, you know, it's like, well, I wanted to play you when I was a kid, but I didn't get to. Um, it was really something. And to go to his ceremony, which was beautiful at the National Cathedral, just thousands and thousands of people, it was really spectacular. And interestingly, uh, Gene Cernan, the last man to walk on the moon, gave the eulogy. And he had said, um, he said, you know, it, um, it was great. He said, uh, you know, a lot of us after Apollo 11, for those who don't know, the, the target landing site was too rocky to land on. So he basically had the joystick and was going around with the last 60 seconds of fuel looking for a better place to land. And he landed with a few seconds of and Gene Cernan had said, you know, I, I said to Neil, I said, you were so cool. We, we were all just, just trembling, and you were just so cool with your, your hand at the controls, and how, how did you keep your cool? And Neil looked at me, Gene Cernan, and he said, well, everybody knows when the gauge reads empty, there's still a little bit left in the tank. <laughs> it was a very touching service. Um, another was, um, I think it was an STS-134, the second to last launch. I met Michael Collins. Um, I didn't tell him a story about when I was a kid, but, uh, but that was a real treat for me. Uh, another was a young girl named Clara Palm. Clara was in eighth grade at the time, I think, uh, 13, and she won a naming contest for the Curiosity rover. It was called the Mars Science Lab, and she wrote an essay, I think it should be called Curiosity, and she got all this publicity. She got to go to launch, she got to go to landing, she got to meet all kinds of people. She was a great kid, just a beautiful kid. And I, I wanted to talk to her when I saw her at the launch. And I, I went up to her and I said, I'm going to lead out the lobby. I'm the chief scientist. She's like, 
Oh my God, she got like all weak in the knees. The two sides of the master. Slow down, kids. It's a rock star you're going to see later, which I'll get to in another slide. Um, but, but just the, the kids, you know, the, the NASA brand, the, the impact on education, and just capturing children was, was amazing. And to, to be a part of that was really a privilege. And speaking of kids, I, I love that. I get a few just wonderful letters from various children. Um, Dear NASA, i got to capitalize on you. <laughs> <laughs> Carbon dioxide and... In, oh, is there carbon dioxide in space? If there is, you can send a probe with seeds to plant the seeds on a planet with water, Mars and the moon, in parentheses, and sunlight. This is because plants take in carbon dioxide. The planet also needs an atmosphere. Then there'll be oxygen, G-I-N. Uh, is there carbon dioxide in space? Is there atmosphere on planets? And is the sun sunlight and water on any planet. Oh, is there sunlight and water on any planet? Toby Gouch, I guess, can't connect it for you. But these letters would come in periodically, and they make you stop and think. You know, kids are excited. They're dreaming up ways of having people on other planets and, and you know, how we can make it work. It was, it was just, it was great. I loved getting these letters. Had the privilege of going to the last um, launch. This was the day that NASA went out of business. Uh, <laughs> um, also the launch of the uh, Dragon Caps along the Falcon 9 rocket. The first commercial entity to send something cargo to space and retrieve it from uh, the space station. This was um, the, the SpaceX that made this was founded by Elon Musk. His brother actually owns the kitchen in Boulder, Kimball, Kimball, Kimball Musk. Um, really an intense guy. You know, he started, well, he sold the company to what ultimately became PayPal. He started, um, he started Tesla Motors and now SpaceX. And this was great. This was my first billionaire's party. He had a party when, when it landed brought the capsule in and had a sign on it said, please don't pet the dragon. And he had, it was my first billionaire's party. There's a Tesla parked out front with, with some model kind of showing it off and people pulling up in their Mercedes and Rolls Royces. And this was when the government motor fleet just switched to Ford Fusions. And, and I showed up with Charlie, my boss, and a Fusion. And everybody's like, oh, the government people are here. <laughs> But they loved us because we paid the money that allowed them to do this. Um, but really, this was a piece of history. This was commercial, the first major step in commercial takeover of low Earth orbit activities. When I left, I got a nice plaque or uh, picture frame. This is Charlie Bolin with the pins from all the shuttle missions. Um, and it was really, really a, a touching thing. I, think, you know, I was only there for the last couple by the way, this Colorado flag was flown in space, um, and he gave that to me. But I, I put this up because there were really a lot of great connections with some amazing people, the administrator included. Um, this is from the Mars launch. I'm almost done here. This is from the Mars launch. This is my daughter, Jada, with her VIP guest pass. Um, this is Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas, who gave a private concert to a group of about 200 of us. Uh, he wanted big on STEM and wanted to perform for the families and people involved. This is the director of the Office of Education at NASA, Leland Melvin, who not only was an astronaut, but also a professional football player. He's lived two boyhood dreams. <laughs> and he and, and Will are good friends, and they teamed up, and he did the concert. And my other daughter, who's not in the picture, who wasn't too thrilled with leaving Colorado to go live in the greater Washington area. The day after the concert, um, she said to me, she said, Dad, yesterday I think was the best day of my life. Uh, and I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I mentioned the front row seat. This is the Curiosity landing. Uh, where was I? I was here. Um, there was, you couldn't be at a console unless you actually had a function. <laughs> the class, well, so we, we, we on it or 
<laughs> um, amazing though, while everybody was watching the animations, you know, in our room there was just a graph. It was just a, it was a uh, HD TV with just a graph on it of the Doppler shift, of the speed of the craft. And it would populate every second at a point along the graph. And it was like a pulse. You just got a reminder every second. It's still there. It's still working. This is unbelievable. And when it entered the atmosphere, the speed went down a little bit through the atmospheric drag. When the parachute deployed, it, it went down a lot. And, and it was, you know, I, I mean, I was just mesmerized. A lot of us just mesmerized by this graph because there was this pulsing and it was doing exactly what it should. And then the, uh, the jets fire that, that suspended the sky crane that then, lo that then lowers the spacecraft. And it hit zero. I mean, the velocity just hit zero, and it was it was incredible. I mean, we have a touchdown on Mars. Just, just absolutely amazing. So, really an incredible experience. Um, but I come back to where I started uh, and say this was really about answering questions at the heart of the human spirit. You know, where did we come from? Where are we going? Are we all? What's what's the fate of our planet? How do we understand? Um, and there are a lot of committed people. When we, when we, as researchers, we write our grants, and we know our program offers, or whatever, we're trying to get money. I think sometimes we lose sight of how hard everybody is working to make it so we can do these things. And it really was a privilege to, to lead the agency in this particular area. But really, this is the Earth Ride, um, really it's about looking back at ourselves 